exactly, I can say that. <laughs> Exceeded to the invitation of uh, sharing today uh, this event with us, uh, helping us on our reflection on the, the findings of the World Ocean Assessment uh, and our efforts to translate it to top decision makers and politicians, but that will be Professor Maria João to explain as the promoter of this project. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoy this session. Uh, okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's uh, very nice to see very old friends. Um, the Globe Ocean was a project that we su submitted to EEA grants, which are funded by Norway, Liechtenstein, and Iceland. And the aim of the project was to make uh, infographics films for general public, even for children, um, to tell the story of the World Ocean Assessment. Um, I will pass the word to Alan Simcock because he knows very well. Uh, he has been the fun, one of the funder fathers of the World Ocean Assessment. Uh, but the idea behind this project was based on the World Ocean Assessment 2, which has the first chapter, which is already aligned to the uh, societal needs of the decade, and passed then into five different films. Uh, one will be based on general ocean, the other with marine pollution, a third one with the fisheries and aquaculture, and the fourth one on resources, and there will be a fifth one which is not finished yet. Uh, and the aim is to pass also information to decision making. So we were funded and we thought to take this opportunity to show to everybody during the Ocean Conference their product of the United Nations regular process. But for, the, for to, to tell the story, I will pass the word into uh, Alan Simcock because he knows a lot more than I do. Thank you very much. I hope you'll forgive me if I go back a very long way, at least what now seems a very long way, to the first Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. That had a document called Agenda 21, the agenda for the 21st century. One of the chapters of that was about oceans and all seas. And as that was negotiated and agreed, it became clear that one of the major problems about the ocean was that there were so many organizations involved, but no focus where the problems of the ocean could be looked at as a whole. During the 1990s, a lot of discussions went on, and that resulted in 1999 in the UN General Assembly agreeing that sh there should be what was called the informal consultative process on the ocean and the law of the sea. The remit of this arrangement, we can't call it a body or an organization because it was informal, was to have somewhere where, any, where all the aspects of the oceans could be looked at in sequence. And this has now been going on for uh, 21 years. It, has a, a, it is only allowed to be set up for three years at a time and then looked at to see whether it's still worthwhile. But it has survived six reviews, so it must be doing something worthwhile. As the informal consultative process looked at various issues, it became clear to many people who were involved that what was needed was a comprehensive look at all the aspects of the ocean, all the aspects relevant for sustainable development. And sustainable development, as you will know, has three legs to the tripod, the environment, economics, and society. And from the start, the idea was that the World Ocean Assessment would look at all three legs of the sustainable development tripod. In 2002, the Johannesburg uh, Summit on Sustainable Development agreed that there should be this, and the United Nations General Assembly later that year 
took up this and agreed it. It took the best part of seven years to work out how to do it. Um, part of this was the problem that some people felt that although you needed to have a look at all aspects of the ocean, there were some bits of the ocean that were so special they shouldn't be included, such as fisheries. And it took four years for this sort of argument to be sorted out. And it then took three years to work out the actual practicalities of doing it. Unfortunately, in 2009, when the report on how to do it was put before the General Assembly, we had had the world uh, economic crisis and nobody had any money. So that as the first cycle of the World Ocean Assessment started in 2010, it was a question of how to do it without spending any money, which is not the best way in which to start a, a project of this kind. By begging and borrowing and twisting arms and so on, we did manage to mobilize the resources that allowed the project to go ahead. The way in which it was done was to rely on experts from around the world. In the first cycle, it proved to be quite difficult to persuade a lot of people to take part. Um, in particular, and uh, throughout the process, it has been difficult, to, it was difficult to persuade Russia to take part. Um, but the Chinese, the Japanese, the Indians, all made major contributions and provided people who could assist the group of experts who were 22 people from around the world to put together the first assessment. The first assessment looked at a, a number of ways of looking at the project. Um, to begin with, we had wondered how to, to, do, to structure it. Should it be focused on ecosystem services? Should it be fact the, the ecosystem services that the ocean provides to the world? Should it be focused on human activities? Or should it be focused on ecosystems themselves? In the end, we ended up with a sort of cubist approach of looking at all three aspects to try and indicate how they fitted together. The second assessment, we reviewed the way in which that had been done and came up with a different structure uh, based mainly on state and processes. The first part looked particularly at the state of the different components of the oceans from all the different species that are found there to all the different human activities that go on there. And then the second part looked at the pressures that were affecting the state. The third uh, assessment, I understand, will have yet another way of looking at it. But the important thing is that the, the assessment is looking at something so huge, so complex, and so little understood that we are still struggling to get our minds around just how big this problem is. And the the way in which this is arising is very complicated. One example which is mentioned in the first assessment and which always strikes me as being a very good example of the way in which we do not understand or find it easy to get our mind around the interactions concerns international submarine cables. About 90% of the internet is carried at some stage in its existence by international submarine cables. These all go over the edge of the continental shelf. And if there are landslips there, the cables can be broken and problems can result. Landslips, submarine landslips, are often caused by intense storms. And what is happening is that climate change is moving 
the intense storms, the hurricanes, the typhoons, the cyclones, to different parts, which have on the whole not had to undergo those sorts of pressures. And there have been cases where the result of a hurricane has been the breaking of the submarine cable and interference with the internet. And you can understand how over the last 20 years that has become a real issue. So what we have, I think, is a set of problems that are complicated but which need to be explained and brought home to everyone because the way that seven-tenths of the planet operates is going to affect the three-tenths on which we live. And we need to make people understand this. I think the Globe Ocean project is a very good step towards this. I wish we could have done it earlier, but uh, I think you will find that the films are a very important step in producing material that we hope can be brought round the world to give an understanding of what the ocean is and is doing and where it is threatened. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan. And uh, um, if I may, uh, after uh, 